What if a city was designed around hexagon blocks? Imagine it, an entire landscape filled with hexagons as far as the eye can see. That's actually one of the beautiful things about hexagons. You can continuously tile them and they fit together perfectly. Now, that's also true with triangles and you can even do it with grids, the typical square or rectangular grid, but you can't do that with octagons or circles. Hexagons have another useful advantage. They create all three-way intersections instead of the normal four-way intersections found in orthogonal grids. Three-way or T intersections have been shown to be far safer than four-way intersections as they eliminate a particularly dangerous type of crash where one car blows through a red light and hits a crossing car. Even better, but streets in a hexagon system meet at 120 degrees, increasing visibility. You might be saying that that would be annoying if you're trying to go straight from one point to another. That's a lot of intersections and small zigs and zags to go where you need to go. But if you're trying to go on a diagonal, an orthogonal grid is pretty inefficient too, and hexagons actually win. Hexagons also require less road per land area, as a hexagon better approximates a circle than a typical square found in a grid. This means that there's more land available for development and it's just more affordable for development in the first place. But maybe you want some parks. Well, how about having one hexagon dedicated to a park with hexagons of development surrounding the park? Then repeat that pattern. You're never more than two hexagons away from an open space. I know you're waiting for the other shoe to drop. If hexagons are so great, why don't we have cities full of them? Well, let's uncover that mystery after the bike bell. Okay. I'm gonna spoil the video right now. Why don't we have hexagon blocks? The answer is more or less cul-de-sacs and loops. As the suburbs started growing in the US, we just defaulted to using cul-de-sacs and loops. But there was a dedicated group out there, real hexagon heads, who said that our blocks should have six sides. And you won't believe how close the US got to having hexagon blocks in the suburbs. Perhaps the first person to sketch out a city based on hexagons was New York architect Charles Lamb. In 1904, he was living in Manhattan and basically hated the grid system there. He said, the artistic possibilities have been ignored and basically only like Broadway because it was a diagonal street that cut through the monotonous gridiron of streets and avenues. He was a big fan of L'Enfant's plan for Washington DC with his diagonal boulevards terminating at important landmarks like the Capitol building. Here's his hypothetical city design. It's based on hexagons, though the blocks themselves are not hexagonal, negating some of the benefits I described earlier. It's basically a more rational and repeatable Washington, D.C. Lamb didn't succeed in making hexagons the new standard in the city design, but maybe the Austrian Rudolf Muller would have better luck. In 1908, he used an efficiency argument to promote the concept. Here's his diagram, where he's labeled where pipes and fire hydrants would go. He believes cities would need less infrastructure if hexagons were used. It's worth noting that like Lamb's design, this is not a pure hexagon plan. Muller used a hexagon and triangle scheme, the triangles in the center of the hexagons would be green space or feature public buildings and churches. The plan was criticized for not having streets where buildings occupied both sides of a block. Now, sometimes one-sided streets work like Michigan Avenue in Chicago or the streets facing Central Park in New York, but they're really the exception. Most places need that density of activity to ensure enough business. The one benefit of the hexagon and triangle system was that you actually got parallel streets, which made them easier to integrate into existing cities. He drafted a proposal to fit hexagons into Vienna, but it never got adopted. Still, Muller's drawings looked cool and there began to be some buzz among architects and planners in favor of hexagons. The next person to pick up the idea and run with it was Nulan Koshan, a Canadian planner and engineer. I'm telling you, hexagons are like catnip to efficiency-minded engineers. Koshan had read an excellent critique of Lamb and Muller's designs that highlighted a simple fact. Those hexagon designs were just overly complex, resulting in intersections that were a traffic nightmare. By the 1920s, when Kochan was thinking about hexagons, cars had begun to make their appearance on city streets and traffic flow became a top concern. The 120 degree angle of three streets meeting was great for all the reasons I already mentioned, and Kochan embraced these simplified intersections. He created Hexagonopolis, a hypothetical city designed around the shape. He also showed how hexagons could integrate into existing cities, like this diagram here. Hexagons gained some traction just at the right time, and if it had not been for Thomas Adams, we might have had hexagons all over the United States. So if there are any hexagon heads out there, Adams is who you should be blaming. Adams was also Canadian. Both he and Kachan were actually both from Ottawa, in fact. He was also interested in the most efficient pattern for streets because, like I said, the car was increasingly prevalent and suburbs began to creep across the countryside, and most were poorly planned. 
Adams went to Harvard and actually co-authored a book on this very topic. He wanted to know which street pattern would be most cost efficient to develop. His initial analysis showed that indeed, hexagons were the most cost effective way of providing roads and services while maximizing land for sale. But that's not what Adams published in his book because he wasn't a hexagon head. He was a cul-de-sac, he was like a cul-de-sac comrade, a cul-de-sac creep. I don't know, he was on team cul-de-sac basically. They were all the rage in the late 1920s, especially after the influential plan for Radburn, New Jersey popularized the concept. People like Adams loved how quiet the streets were and how they could be inserted just about anywhere, even odd shaped parcels, which made them very practical. But hexagons were more efficient. How did Adams deal with this? He took Cushon's plan and essentially made it less efficient for his analysis. It basically looks nothing like Cushon's original plan and includes way more open space than necessary, lowering its efficiency score. In 1932, President Herbert Hoover held a conference on home building designed to spur new private home development which had basically stopped during the Great Depression. Adams' book was highly influential and cul-de-sacs won the hearts and minds of the thousands of industry representatives there. A later government committee on the topic would say, although there is no doubt that the hexagon may be used in certain cases with advantage, the practical difficulty of its application for low-cost developments is that it produces a large number of odd-shaped lots. Basically, the main problem home builders had with hexagons is that they created lots that tapered toward the center of the hexagon. So you ended up with big front yards and small backyards. Cul-de-sacs created pie-shaped lots too, but they were smaller near the street and wide in the back, making them more attractive to home buyers. You could combine cul-de-sacs and hexagons in a way that created a really nice use of space, but that never really took off either. That's pretty much the end of the story. The federal government would go on to incentivize the use of cul-de-sacs and residential design, and hexagons just never really made a comeback. That's why we really only have three prevailing systems of street design today. The organic pattern that typified old cities designed before the Industrial Revolution and before the car, the efficient gridiron pattern, and the suburban cul-de-sac pattern. But there's a little bit more to this story. Yeah, hexagons never really caught on everywhere, but they're around if you know where to look. Here are a couple prominent examples. The first is Canberra, the capital of the great nation of Australia. It was designed as a part of a competition by Walter Burley Griffin and Marion Mahoney Griffin in 1912. And once you know it, there's a hexagon right here. The original plan called for even more unique geometries, but they were value engineered out. But the hexagon survived. The Griffins would likely have been aware of Lamb and Muller's hexagon ideas too, and that could be where it came from. The other prominent hexagon is in another plan capital, this time in New Delhi, India. It's located right here at one end of an axis that starts with the presidential palace and ends at the India gate. New Delhi's design process began the same year the Griffins were designing Canberra, and there are some obvious parallels, including the hexagon. The question is, will we see hexagons making a comeback anytime soon? I mean, they're so efficient, right? Well, I'm not a hexagon head, but I say, why not? There are so many advantages associated with hexagons. Let's give it a shot. Do we need to start a movement here to make hexagons happen? Let me know in the comments. Well, anyway, hexagons won't solve all of our urban problems, but there is a solution that might solve a few more problems. It's a different approach to zoning that we're used to here in the United States, and it's called form-based codes. Basically, instead of regulating how a piece of land is used, you just regulate the form of the building and don't worry so much about the use. And unlike hexagons, form-based codes have actually been adopted by communities. I've been wanting to do a video on this topic for a while now, and I finally did. The cool thing is that video is live right now on Nebula. You can go watch it without waiting. That's because we have this thing called Nebula First. Every time I post a video on YouTube, my next video is already live on Nebula waiting to be watched. It's like living in the future, it's amazing. Other creators are doing the same thing, meaning you can watch videos from Johnny Harris, Legal Eagle, Jetlag, and more earlier than you find them on YouTube. Signing up is the only way to get this content early. It's one of the best ways of supporting this channel, in part because I'm a co-owner of Nebula along with all the other creators on the platform. That's one of the reasons why it's so great. It's creator owned, which means we make it really viewer centric. We want it to be great for you guys. We even have an active Reddit community where people post suggestions and comments, and it's not uncommon for our CEO to reply back. That's pretty amazing. Now, if you want another reason to sign up for Nebula, I have one. We post a ton of exclusive content there. This includes my Great City series. I profiled six cities at critical points in their history. This includes Paris during Houseman's renovation, the development of the Shanghai metro system, the world's largest, and how Venice got its canals. And if the hexagon in Canberra got your attention, I did a profile of the design of Canberra back in 1912. Nebula gave me a bigger budget to produce them, 
so they're really quite good if I do say so. I also have a Nebula original video called Planning Ancient Rome that I absolutely love, as well as some shorter bonus videos that you can check out. Other creators are posting amazing original exclusive content to Nebula as well. One of my favorites is the Jetlag series, which is sort of like a travel game show involving a lot of trains and funny challenges. If you like my channel, I can pretty much guarantee you, you will get addicted to that series. Now, Nebula is normally priced at a completely reasonable $50 per year. But if you use my code CityBeautiful when you sign in, you get $20 off that annual plan. That brings it down to $250 a month, which is really the best deal in streaming for what you get. So go click on the link on screen or in the description and get $20 off an annual plan and go watch my next video. It's up right now. Thanks.